Hello, and welcome to The Security Show, where we hang out with the most influential experts in security, compliance, and identity. To learn about the challenges they face and the technologies they use to solve them. I'm Natalia Godilla from the Microsoft Security Team and co-host of Security Unlocked. And I'm Nick Fillingham, also from the Microsoft Security Team and also co-host of the Security Unlocked podcast. On with the show. Welcome to another episode of The Security Show. Today, we are joined by Ed Scotus. We'll be talking about threat hunting. With that, Ed, it would be great if you could introduce yourself to our audience. Sure, my name is Ed Scotus. I'm a fellow with the SANS Institute. Um, I love cybersecurity. I've been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, I work on both offense and defense. So we do penetration testing and red teaming, and we also do threat hunting, incident analysis, and expert witness services. Awesome, I love the energy you're bringing to the show. So uh, I know that you have an Enigma machine and you've told us that you're interested in antiquing, so we have to ask about that. What is your favorite invention over time? And if you could meet any inventor, who would it have been? Uh, Favorite invention over time, I'd probably have to go with um, the concept of a computing machine, which you could give to Charles Babbage, but I'm, I'm gonna pull in Alan Turing. And the idea of Alan Turing with this idea of a general purpose computing system. So what exactly is threat hunting and how did it come to be? What was the origin of threat hunting? Sure. So if you go back maybe 20 years or so ago, we started to deploy detection technologies in our networks. I'm talking about things like intrusion detection systems. We start doing uh, automated log analysis. Uh, We're just looking for attackers who compromise our systems by setting up these automated tools. And that was all well and good, but people started to notice that the most sophisticated attackers would get into our environment and stay there undetected for a long period of time. If we can proactively apply human ingenuity into an environment to look for attackers who've flown under the radar screen of our automated detection, maybe we can lower the dwell time. The way I think about it is this. You could think of um, all these automated technologies we put in place, intrusion detection systems on on the host, intrusion detection systems uh, on the network, uh, all the log analytics that are happening automatically. You could view those kind of like burglar alarms. So if your burglar tries to kick in the door, it'll go off and you detect them. That's all well and good. But what about your sophisticated burglars? For those, you got to go beyond your burglar alarm. For those, you actually hire some detectives, or you have on your staff detectives that will look for the really subtle things the most sophisticated attackers will do. They're looking for the subtle fingerprints. Another important point of threat hunting is attackers will always leave some evidence, but our automated tools are only so fine-grained, so sometimes we need to call in the humans to augment the automated tools. How much of threat hunting is also adapting your tooling? So uh, bringing that business intelligence to the SOC technology and forming it with what you know about your business, about your users. That is such a great question. Super insightful, Natalia, because, because what some people will do is they'll do threat hunting, right? And, and they find an attacker and, they, and they, they eradicate him, they get him out, that's good. They lowered the dwell time. But if you stop there, you're cutting short the value you can get from threat hunting. Use what your human detectives have learned about real world threats in your environment to improve your burglar alarms. It's a a great feedback loop. How does threat hunting fit with the rest of the security organization? How do threat hunters engage with other members of the security team? One common way for maybe a medium sized or large organization that has a security operations center is to integrate the threat hunters with the SOC. So you you, you have a security operations center that has analysts, they're looking at logs, they're looking at alerts, they're trying to figure out what your burglar alarms are telling you. And if they see something really big come up, they will then invoke a threat hunting team to go and start looking at that in more detail. Maybe there's something more subtle going on. Maybe there's other attackers about, and we wanna find that. So having it as an offshoot of the SOC is one way to do it. And that's fine, that's good. Another way to integrate a threat hunting team with your organization is to have it independent of the SOC. So you have specific threat hunters. If your organization is large enough, you might have a full-time threat hunting team, or 
you might build that team dynamically, maybe some, from some of your best system administrators, some of your best cyber defenders, maybe some of your best SOC analysts. The other thing is the threat hunting team, once it identifies an actual live threat in the environment, needs to be able to hand that off to the incident response team. Because Now, sometimes the threat hunting team itself will do incident response, but in very large organizations, they usually hand it off to another group that's going to take that, do the containment, do the eradication to get the, the attacker out of the environment. Ed, is there a scenario where you might want to have one team that can do both red teaming and threat hunting? Honestly, I don't recommend it. The idea is you've got blue sharpening red, red sharpening blue, so both get better. And this gives rise to this thing called, well, if you have red plus blue, purple teaming, purple teaming. And, and you know, some people get confused when they hear purple teaming, thinking that there is a purple team. Not really. What a purple team is, is where red and blue work together so that you can have blue looking for threats in the environment, red launches an attack, and you're measuring the time of how long it takes blue to detect their activities and then thwart them, and you're trying to lower that time. Sometimes I call it this, you know, we're talking about threat hunting. I call it BYOT, bring your own threat. So I, can I tell you, I am super excited to be doing building blocks. Uh, I think I'm officially a convert to Minecraft building blocks, those in particular, just the <laughs> yes. Minecraft ones. Ed, do you wanna give us a progress update? What have you, how, how are you going? I'm doing well, I'm building a little spaceship here. And uh, I tell you, I love working with building blocks. My son and my daughter and me have built hundreds of different sets. In fact, one of the most complex sets we ever built is above my shoulder here. It's a Wright Flyer, you know, the, the original airplane from the Wright brothers. That one is so fragile, kind of like the original Wright Flyer, uh, that it was really hard to make. But, but my whole office is surrounded with different little building blocks and different, uh, different aspects of them. But most popular, of course, is the spaceship. What are common use cases for threat hunting? Could you share a couple examples? Let me tell you one that we see fairly commonly, but it's not ideal. And that is an organization discovers some anomalous event in their environment. Maybe the CPU spikes on some servers or a database crashes and it's full of garbage or something like that. And they deploy a threat hunting team to say, figure out what's going on here. There's several cases that I've worked on in the past year where an attacker got into the environment and started doing crypto mining. And then when the threat hunting team got deployed to analyze what was happening, it turns out that there was another attacker in the environment, somebody much more subtle, that got in first, and they've been in there with a dwell time of a year or so. So I, I imagine the first attackers that were there got pretty upset at the second one. That's not the ideal use case, because that is sort of reactive, right? A better use case for threat hunting is proactive. That is to have your threat hunters say, here are our most valuable assets. Let's see if they've been successfully compromised. Or here are our most likely to be compromised areas in our network. Or here's a new attack that we're seeing in other places. Has it happened here? And then proactively deploying the threat hunting team on a regular basis to see what's happening in the environment. And what I would recommend to organizations is that if you've never done threat hunting, start, right? Um, maybe uh, do one a year. I'd like to see at least one a quarter in large organizations and maybe even medium scale organizations because they provide that much value. So that use case of being proactive to go in the environment. So do you have, do you have a, like a, a room of all your projects in it? Like do you have a... An, a... Uh, we do have the playroom where we have probably 50 projects in it. And then in my office, I've got a pirate ship up there. I've got a sop with camel which was a, a British fighter plane um, from the Great War uh, over there. And I've got my um, right flyer up behind me. So, uh, oh, also my son, he actually built a replica of my office uh, using those building blocks. Um, Cause my office has a secret room and then the secret room has a secret room inside of it. How are we getting to the secret room Okay, now? hang on, how do we get to see the secret room and all the secret room inside the secret room? <laughs> well, I actually have a, a, a team, my team that works for me, they're working in the secret room right now. <laughs> so we used to do tours of my office, uh, you know, pre-COVID. We'd have s probably two tours come through every month and we'd show them, you know, all the various little things and then this, this sort of idea of electrifying everything so you can talk to it. Um, just showing different people that it, it's, it's actually one of the highlights of my life. I, I really have fun with that. This is, this is a much more complicated, uh, building block set than I thought. I'm, I've now got 
I know, so Ed, you're, you're freestyling, right? I'm totally freestyling. I like to do that myself. Are you going according to the instructions? I'm actually following the instructions and there are moving parts in this. And Is I, there really? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a thing here that's gonna sort of slide like a piston. So Ed, what are some best practices for organizations looking to try threat hunting for the very first time? You gotta prepare for it in advance, but usually what you do is you start with understanding your own networked environment. So whoever you're gonna assign to your threat hunting team, make sure you get them network documentation that, that, that shows the layout of things, that shows where important data is, important processing functionality. And you also wanna choose people, maybe from your operations team, to augment your threat hunting team. You wanna choose people that know what normal is for your environment. What normally is running on your systems? What are normal data flows in the environment? What is normal usage, whether it be CPU, memory, network access? So you gotta start with understanding what normal is. Then you need to understand what the attackers do, right? I mean, you have to understand the threats or you're not gonna be very good at hunting the threats. Now, some people think, well, you know, an attacker could do almost anything. There's an infinite number of ways in. Actually, there's certain techniques that they apply very consistently. So you wanna make sure your threat hunters understand them. So phase one, understand the environment. Phase two, understand the attacker. You hypothesize that, hey, the attackers may have applied this recent technique to these systems. So you create some sort of hypothesis. Maybe we were attacked there, maybe we were exploited there, and it should be pretty specific, associated with specific sets of systems in your environment. So that's phase three. Then in phase four, you brainstorm about ways that you can get data to either prove or disprove your hypothesis, right? Where can we pull logs? Where can we get network flow information? Maybe you go even so far as to capture memory from these devices to start analyzing it, right? So you figure out where you can get your data. You then gather your data and do your analytics. Once you've done your analytics, you either prove or disprove your hypothesis or see where you can get more information. What might happen here though, is it turns out your hypothesis is true. You've been attacked. In which case then you feed this off to an incident response team. Ed, can you walk us through the typical quintessential threat hunting process? Is there perhaps an example that you like to use when you're teaching? Sure, let, let, me, let me give you a specific case that I worked on. So there was a, a new attack technique that was implemented uh, for command and control. And this organization realized that it was getting some widespread use in their same industry. So this organization had a threat hunting team that knew what normal was for their organization. They knew what the attackers are doing. So they created this hypothesis that, hey, this command and control channel might be used inside our organization on these particular sensitive systems. So now that they have their hypothesis, they look for data flows that would be associated with this. This includes log analysis. Let's look at the logs and see if these systems have been compromised so the malware can get deployed. But even more important, let's look at the network activity that's happening. Because this particular command and control channel used DNS and HTTPS, kind of augmenting the two. So let's see if we can see on the network those command and control channels being used. Also, the attackers were often employing cloud-based systems to control their victims. So let's see if we see DNS and HTTPS being sent outward to various cloud-based servers for some of the big cloud providers. And it, sure enough, they actually found it in use on one of their systems. So what do you do now? Well, if you have incident response capabilities in the hunt team, you start doing incident response. That is, start thinking of ways that you can block the attacker so they don't cause any more damage and that you can eradicate them quickly. Ed, what tools do you use when you're threat hunting? Is there a, a common toolbox that all threat hunting teams use? There's great commercial tools out there, but you know, we'll say on the free side of things, so people can dip their foot in the water without you know, buying something, right? So from a, a free tool perspective, I focus on two types of tools. One is sort of a, a framework environment that you can do threat hunting in, and the other is individual piece part tools. And you kind of want to have both, and they also work together. So from the sort of framework threat hunting environment, there's some great tools that are available. Um, there is a tool called Zeek, that's Z-E-E-K, and uh, Zeek is a great environment for gathering data from, from a network, including things like uh, packet captures, including things like logs, uh, including things like 
uh, issues discovered on end systems, and then doing various kinds of queries and analysis of it. Another great one is an entire Linux distribution called Security Onion. A friend of mine named Eric Conrad, he's a, he's a SANS instructor as well, he created a tool called Deep Blue CLI, CLI's command line interface. What this is, is it's a series of PowerShell scripts that you can feed Windows event logs to. And it applies various heuristics to go through the Windows event logs, and it'll, it, it, it's really easy to use. You simply run deep blue CLI, tell it where the file is with your event logs, and it kind of chugs through the whole file saying, I see some evidence here that looks like an attacker did lateral movement from this system to that system. There's another free standalone tool created by another friend of mine. His name is John Strand, and uh, he's created a tool called Rita. And Rita's focus is on network activity that might be nefarious. Another tool that's really quite nice, especially working in a multi-operating system environment, is a tool called OS Query. You know, Deep Blue CLI focuses on Windows event logs. Uh, if you look at Rita, it focuses on network activity. But OS Query can pull information from Windows machines, but also things like Mac OS systems and other operating systems, which is kind of cool. Um, Microsoft Sys Internals, right, by Mark Rusinovich, um, has Sysmon. And Sysmon, it, it also is a miracle. It gives you very detailed insight into what's happening on a Windows machine so that you can look at all the processes, the process hierarchies, like what is the parent process of this process and what's the parent process of that? What DLLs are they loading? What, what interactions are they having with the registry? It is a, an incredible tool for doing detail analysis. So I'd recommend for any threat hunter or would-be threat hunter, understand Sysmon, start looking at that. It's, it's freely available from Microsoft, really cool stuff. So what's the future of threat hunting? How do you think it'll evolve over time in the next five years, 10 years? I, I think the biggest thing, I mean, we're seeing it emerge now, but is integration of the cloud. Right, and, and there's some really great stuff uh, from a threat hunting perspective uh, in various cloud services. For example, uh, in Microsoft Azure, there's a, a, a set of features bundled together uh, called Sentinel. And if you go into Azure Sentinel, there's a specific page on hunting with built-in queries that you can use to find anomalous things. Another big uh, trend is this trend toward purple teaming. It used to be red would do their thing. And then if you detected it, hey, that's fine. If you didn't, hey, that's fine. Or blue would do their thing, maybe even with threat hunting, but without integration with red. And this red plus blue working together, I think that is a, that is a really huge thing that's driving uh, this forward. And then also just the increased proliferation of threat hunting. You know, 30% now, it'd be nice to see that get to 40 or 50%. I want to take a moment to pause and see how your ship came out. I'm doing all right with it. Not bad. I'm not, not quite done. I guess these things are never done. It almost looks like, do you remember that old video game Galaga? Absolutely. Yes. I was about to say it looks I like an alien. <laughs> so Ed, are there any resources that you could share with our audience if they'd like to continue to research some of the best practices that you shared today or get to know hunt, threat hunting a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, my, my own Twitter handle is my name, simply Ed Scotus, E-D-S-K-O-U-D-I-S, -S, of course. Um, there is a great uh, Blue Team blog at the Sands Institute. Um, and uh, they also have the Sands Blue Team curriculum, which is on Twitter as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you for being on the show today with us, Ed. My pleasure. Thank you. It was great fun. I really enjoyed uh, building with these building blocks. So, so thanks for taking the time to do that. And uh, thanks for letting me share. Awesome. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for joining us again on The Security Show. Reach out to us on at MSFT Security on the Twitters or comment below to share your thoughts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to never miss an episode. See you next time.